So my name is Marima Shabanov, and I'm a final year PhD student here at University of Oxford, and I've been developing a project for the past uh, for the past few years, looking at long term effects of psychedelic drugs on higher levels of plasticity, specifically anatomy and behavior. I don't think that this audience needs a lot of reminding why we find psychedelics a fascinating area uh, of research, but um, for me, it was just thinking about the goal of any therapy. We want something to induce a fast and lasting change in behavior. And the traditional pharmacological therapies that we have for mental disorders remain not as effective as we would want them to be. They require weeks or even months to start showing effects. If they do at all, they require you to keep taking your happy pill in order to feel those effects and are associated with the wealth of different side effects. And even if you are able to stop taking the drug, you're most likely to go through a withdrawal syndrome. On the other hand, the past decade, decade and a half has seen a very publicized research into psychedelic assisted psychotherapy that proves that with just a, a single dose or a few doses of, uh, of a psychedelic, you can have fast and lasting remission from very different disorders across very different symptomatologies. And when administered in controlled settings, they are very safe and non-addictive. So of course, we're going to start wondering, well, how come they get to be so special? And one of the original theories um, things got messed up in this computer, so I apologize, things look a bit weird. But one of the original theories that uh, have been developed by Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt was that psychedelic assisted therapy opens up this window of enhanced plasticity and environmental sensitivity such that significant therapeutic work can be done and you can have lasting mood and behavioral changes. And this process does not just occur in disease populations, but in healthy individuals as well. Plasticity, uh, which we define as capacity for change at the level of the brain, can be considered from just a single neuron to whole brain regions to functional networks between brain regions, which we just heard about now, and finally, at the level of cognition and behavior. We have growing evidence that there is a wealth of cellular uh, plasticity effects happening due to psychedelics. So within just, um, most notably in that first week after drug treatment, we have a rapid growth of new dendritic branches, new spines, these spines do form functional synapses such that there is a consequence to them, both amplitude and frequency of spontaneous and miniature excitatory currents of neurons are increased in that same time frame. And these changes can persist up to one month after just a single dose of the drug. So naturally we can predict that there might be a snowball effect that these cellular plasticity effects will result in correlated simultaneous facilitation of higher level plasticity changes as well. And that's where we come in to try and see a proof of principle working in a healthy mouse model. Can a single moderate dose, and here we're using a synthetic drug called DOI, can we see evidence of this environmental sensitivity that should follow enhanced plasticity? Can we see enhanced cognitive flexibility? And also, can we find evidence of regional uh, volume changes in the brain, at least at the level of grain matter, which should be, again, followed by these uh, cellular effects? And for this, we use a triangulation of different methods of behavior, pharmacology, and imaging. Jumping right in into our experiment on environmental sensitivity, what we did is that we habituated one subset of animals to a recording chamber prior to drug injection. So to them, their, envir uh, their environment was familiar, while the other animals only saw that uh, their recording chamber on the day of injection. So to them, it was a novel environment. And we gave them that single dose of DOI. And in the first 30 minutes after the drug, we were first looking at these uh, psychedelic-like responses in mice, uh, mice, which are called head twitches. So it's just a rotational movement of the head. And these are part of the normal repertoire uh, for the animals. So they are present at a low baseline level in the vehicle control animals, but are dramatically increased in the presence of DOI. However, more so in those animals injected in a novel environment. We also looked at exploration effects. So this graph shows you the total uh, kind of distance traveled in those same 30 minutes after injection. And you can see that there's no drug related effects in the animals injected in a novel environment. However, for those injected in a familiar environment, there was a significant reduction in the total amount of distance traveled. We saw the same pattern of results looking at exploration of novel objects. So we just placed two novel objects in the recording chamber for about 15 minutes and see if, you know, an animal even cared uh, while they were on the drug. And so the same pattern as with locomotion, there was no drug related difference in the novel environment, but a significant reduction in the exploration of novel objects in the familiar environment. So together what this data showed us is that novelty enhanced sensitivity to the psychedelic effects, 
but familiarity enhanced sensitivity to exploration effects of the drugs. This was a, an important validation that we can find evidence of environmental sensitivity in animals as well as in humans. Next, we looked at cognitive flexibility. And for this, we used a two-step decision-making task that, as the name suggests, requires the mouse to first initiate the task at a central poke. They're doing this in an operant chamber. And then it has to make a choice between going left or going right. And depending on that choice, one of the top or bottom states is going to light up and deliver a water reward. These are water deprived animals, so they're very keen to find that water. And uh, the caveat is that there is a probabilistic structure to this task. So the water reward uh, is present at a higher 80% chance only at one of these top or bottom books. And the transition between that step one, going left and right, and step two, going top or bottom, is also probabilistic, such that, for example, in one state of the task, left choice will most commonly take you to the up state 80% of the time, and the reverse being true for a right choice. So if you were an animal and wanted to get water, the correct choice would be to pick left, because that will most commonly take you to the up state, and that's where you will most often find the water. The um, further complication of the task is that these probabilities can change. So the first thing that can change is the reward probabilities. Instead of being more rewarded at the top poke, you will now be more rewarded at the down poke. And these are actually learned by the animals throughout training and throughout testing. They are surprisingly very good at these, and a superstar mouse can do about 20 reward reversals in 90 minutes. So they, they are very good at adapting to them, and that's the first thing that we're going to look at. First at baseline, after the mice have been fully trained up on the task without any manipulation at this point, this graph shows you the fraction of choices the animal is making to the pre-reversal correct side. So before a reversal happens in the gray shaded area, you can see that the animal is picking the correct side almost all of the time. It has learned uh, what, what's the right way to go. But after a reward reversal happens, it will switch away slowly and start picking the opposite side more often. So even though the legend here says that these are uh, this is a comparison between two treatment groups. Keep in mind, they haven't actually received the drug at this point. So this is just to show that animals are consistent uh, across each other before we give the drug. However, when we do give the drug in that first week after, the, there is a small but statistically reliable difference such that the DOI-treated animals, the shape of their adaptation curve has changed. And we have confirmed this analysis with also utilizing a double exponential model fitted to these curves and then comparing the time constants. So what this means is that basically the shape of the curve has changed such that the DUI treated animals are ever so slightly quicker in the first five to seven trials. So keep in mind, we are very close to ceiling here. As I said, animals are very good at this task, um, but we, we do have some inclination to see that they've become slightly better at uh, adapting to these reversals. More interesting hap uh, thing happens after a reversal in transition probabilities. So instead of right taking us to top, the right will now take us to a bottom poke. And you can imagine that this is a much bigger shift in task structure and is much harder for the animals to adapt to, especially because these are novel. So they haven't actually experienced these reversals until my omnipotent hand uh, does it to them. So we initiate a single transition reversal that one week post drug, and then monitor how the animals relearn the task in the next two weeks. And to look at adaptability in these reversals, we utilize a logistic regression model of state switch behavior. And I'm not going into any detail of this math, so do not worry if, you, if you're not familiar with logistic regression models. The only thing you need to know about this graph is that it shows you a regression coefficient for something that we call an interaction between a reward and transition. So if the value of this regression coefficient is strongly positive, it means that the animal has built an internal model of the task such that it's not just simply repeating rewarded trials. It actually knows that it should repeat trials only if they were preceded by a common transition, because those are the ones that are going to give it reward most often in the future versus those that uh, have been rare transitions. And indeed, that's how the animals solve the task. This, uh, they have a strong positive value on this coefficient. However, after a transition reversal occurs, the sign of this coefficient uh, is opposite just because the animal seems to be following rare transitions. But that's because what now is rare used to be common and the animal is learning that the change has happened. And as they do that over time, they will go back to having a strongly positive value. However, the DOI treated animals seem to do this significantly quicker than the vehicle treated animals. So they were better at switching away, uh, flipping their internal model. So what this data set has showed us is that DOI made animals quicker to uh, relearn rules following both novel and learned reversals. 
And uh, I'm not going into any detail of this data now, but we do have some inclination about how can they get to be quicker. And we think it's because they've started incorporating learning, not just from rewards, but reward emissions, something that mice don't normally do. So I'm happy to talk about that later, if anyone's interested. But uh, this is not necessarily impact the amount of learnings so in terms of accuracy, number of rewards, uh, these treatment uh, groups have actually been comparable. In the last few minutes, I just want to talk about the exciting uh, data we have on the structural changes across the brain, because as, um, as you will know, these are very limited when it comes to animals. So in this first study, we took out the brains the next day after drug treatment and did an ex vivo MRI study, which, uh, which was kind of explorative, unbiased across the whole brain. And we did see several areas that had significant volume increases. So they were all volume increases, which we would predict from the cellular um, plasticity changes. And they were mostly in sensory areas, such as the um, auditory and somatosensory cortex association areas. And the strongest changes we've seen were in the primary visual cortex. So we know that 24 hours after, there are uh, increased volume of sensory areas. We're currently analyzing a study that is uh, on brains that were taken three weeks after DOI, and we do not seem to find any volume differences there. So it's either that these changes have normalized by this point in time, or they have diminished to the point where we're no longer sensitive with whole brain MRI to find them. Nonetheless, uh, our data as a whole shows us that a single moderate dose of DOI can have long lasting effects on both brain and behavior. These are likely very time dependent, uh, very task dependent, also probably dose and drug dependent, but I'm sure our next speaker will actually be talking about that a lot more. Um, so for me, thank you very much for your attention. And these are other people that have made this work possible. Yes, so the, the data that I shown at uh, the graph about the regression coefficient that looks at transition outcome interaction, there the regression coefficient involves both rewards and reward emissions. But we know that there is asymmetry in learning such that mice just pay attention to rewards and don't care about reward emissions. So when we built a different model where we actually split that regression coefficient to code separately for rewards and reward emissions, what we found is that it is a non-significant predictor for choice behavior in vehicle-treated animals and for DOI-treated animals at baseline throughout the task. But after this transition reversal, in those last few sessions, where we do see um, that they're becoming quicker at relearning, we also see that that uh, reward emission predictor becomes significant. So they've actually started incorporating learning from reward emissions too, such that they're switching away from uh, reward emissions that were preceded by a rare transition. So that they've actually have built a, a richer model of the task uh, compared to the vehicle animals. Does that help answer? I'm just thinking at that from the talks later on, um, so I don't have to um, What would you anticipate would happen if uh, what was interesting in terms of normality or familiarity in the environment was actually like a normal engagement or like a sense of engagement? <laughs> Um, so what we think happens with the novelty familiarity is that in a, in a familiar cage, the animal was able to uh, not have that split attention to having to explore the cage, having to figure out what's happening around them, and was actually able to focus on the internal. Uh, we have no data to support this, so this, was just a, this is just a hypothesis. And, um, you know, sadly, the, the social studies on, on how do animals or humans respond to psychedelics in a social environment are very limited, but there will probably be a difference in terms of if you were with a novel cage mate or with a familiar cage mate. Um, and um, I think aggression might be a, a troubling variable to have to control in those cases. But um, yeah, I, I, I hope that kind of answers the question. Thank you very much. Do I need to do anything? Oh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're now going to hear from Meg Spriggs, who's going to be giving a lightning talk about uh, indexing neuroplasticity in neural research. Uh, after Meg's talk ends at 12, we're going to be having lunch in the canteen upstairs. So, reminder to access the canteen 
um, through the back doors of this lecture theater. Uh, and then we'll be shifting uh, to the Grove Clark Theater um, for all the subsequent presentations. And we'll be uh, convening outside of this building, um, right outside the lobby at 1250 to bring people to that theater. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you for the talks this morning. They've lined up what I'm going to talk about really nicely. Um, so um, today, so I'm Dr. Mix Briggs. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Psychedelic Research at Imperial. And today I'm going to give a, a little brief insight into how I think we can use electrophysiological markers of neuroplasticity as a novel approach for psychedelics um, in humans. Um, now, uh, we just heard a fantastic talk about how um, rodent models are being used to demonstrate um, plasticity mechanisms um, in relation to psychedelics. And this underlies our kind of understanding of how um, you know, we can have these single high-dose psychedelic experiences that can lead to these long-lasting changes. Um, however, one of the things that I think is currently missing from our sort of bridging between these animal models and these long-term therapeutic changes is how do we measure these plasticity processes in humans? How do we measure them during the psychedelic experience and after the psychedelic experience in the human brain? Um, and, you know, if we can better measure these things in humans, then we can better develop our psychedelic assisted therapy processes and, and um, uh, you know, tailor it to different drugs and to different indications so we can really harness this capacity. Um, and also, you know, being able to measure plasticity processes in the human brain um, allows us to better sort of you know, get to grips with this plasticity process between the acute hyperplastic state that psychedelics induce to the short-term plasticity uh, plasticity window that we just heard about um, where, you know, therapeutic intervention can happen and then into the long-term sort of changes. So, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, a, a step or we haven't yet really explored that step between those short-term therapeutic um, <coughs> interventions and how that translates to the long-term um, therapeutic benefits that we see months after a psychedelic experience. And today, I hope that I can kind of convince you that EEG provides us with this unique window for exploring these plasticity mechanisms. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, EEG is the process whereby we put electrodes onto the scalp and we measure the brain's electrical activity. Um, it's a very old neuroimaging technique. It's often forgotten about as it's surpassed by its more technologically advanced cousins, MRI and PET and things. But I hope that today I can convince you that EEG is still a very relevant tool for us to be using in neuroscience. Um, and we've already heard from Morton this morning, uh, you know, a, a about the sort of predictive processing models of brain function. Um, so I don't need to spend too long on my little sort of toy animation of demonstrating this. But um, basically the idea being that, um, you know, our brain builds models of the environment. Um, and these models of the environment are shaped by our experience and they shape our ongoing experience. So we hold these prior beliefs about the world and they sort of are held in these higher order cortical areas and they trickle down the processing hierarchy and shape our experience of information as it comes in um, to the brain as we move around the world. So what's actually sent up that cortical processing hierarchy is the error between what we predict and what we perceive. Um, and then that error signal gets sort of uh, used by our brain to update our models of the environment. And I'd say there's sort of three key steps in this process. The first is error detection, um, which is that error signal that I was talking about. The next is our ability to use that information to update our models of the environment, um, which can happen in the short term, um, perceptual learning. But then there's this process of moving that into long-term model calibration. So transferring that short-term learning into long-term therapeutic change. And we have these two really unique EEG indices that potentially allow us to start unpacking this. Um, so the first is uh, what's called the roving mismatch negativity. And this is where we present participants with sequences of tones. Um, and every so often that 
sequence changes tone frequency. Now, every time the tone frequency changes, the brain gives off this error response, this surprise response, this, I wasn't expecting that response. And that looks a little bit like this. So that um, big blue negative going um, ERP or event related component um, is referred to as the deviant response. That's the mismatch response. And that's your brain your brain's surprise response. Now, with subsequent repetitions of the same tone, that surprise response returns to a baseline or standard response. And that's that process of model updating. Um, so we've got these two processes that can be measured with the roving mismatch negativity. Then we have um, the process whereby that short-term learning um, needs to be translated into long-term learning. And here we have um, the visual long-term potentiation paradigm. So long-term potentiation is the process, the cellular process, whereby um, it's you know, the idea that cells are fired together, wired together, and how we lay down memory formation within the brain. Using the visual long-term potentiation paradigm, what we do is we present participants with um, visual stimuli, um, in this case, vertical and horizontal sign gratings, both before and after what's referred to as a high-frequency visual tetanus. And that tetanus is high-frequency stimulation, and this is based on what they do in rodent models where they use electrical high-frequency stimulation to induce the process of LTP. We're doing it with visual stimulation. And typically what we see following that high-frequency visual tetanus is an enhancement of the N1 and P2 components of the visually evoked response over the occipital cortex. And this is what we believe is representative of an enhancement of synaptic efficacy, thus indicating that the process of um, a sort of LTP has started. So here um, we've got these sort of uh, these two paradigms to look at these three steps of so the three steps that I've outlined. So error detection with the mismatch negativity, um, the roving mismatch negativity with model updating, so repetition suppression, and then that long term calibration. Um, so what evidence do we have for this already? I'm going to um, talk through two sets of results that start to show this um, in the acute and post-acute um, states and psychedelics. Um, so this is some work that Chris Timmerman and I analyzed a, a few years ago now, where we looked at data collected um, from the mismatch negativity um, in the acute LSD state. So 20 participants were presented with the mismatch negativity in two conditions. The first was placebo and the second was LSD. Um, so in the placebo condition, we did see the, the classic mismatch negativity response, which is that the solid blue line um, compared to a standard response, which is the dotted blue line. In the LSD condition, however, there was a reduction in the magnitude of, of the MMN, but an increase in the magnitude of the standard, uh, standard response. So what this demonstrates is there's less of a distinction between what would usually induce a surprise response and what's usually considered standard. So there's less of an error signal, and this corresponds really nicely with what we understand about the acute psychedelic state where people are more open and less rigid and um, sort of opening up that window for the capacity um, to experience things in a new way. And then we have this very new data, um, a, looking at the post-acute phase using the visual LTP paradigm with psilocybin for the first time. So in this study, we have 16 data from 16 participants who were given a low dose or a high dose of psilocybin. And five hours, approximately five hours after psilocybin administration, so this is post-acute, um, uh, in the high dose condition, there was a greater potentiation of the N1 component of the visually evoked potential. So this demonstrates that using the LTP paradigm, we found uh, evidence for an increased uh, capacity to undergo the beginnings of that sort of that transitional process from experience dependent learning to long term change. Um, so that's just two examples of how we can start to use these paradigms. Um, you know, there's lots of open questions remaining around this, and, and I think that, you know, there's, there's lots of, a, lo a long way to go in understanding this plasticity process. Um, but I hope that I've kind of demonstrated how we can use EEG to start looking at that, pro that, that process from the acute hyperplastic state to short-term plasticity to long-term therapeutic change and start to lift that black box that we've got over plasticity mechanisms in the human brain. 
Um, and I'll just finish on this quote here. Um, uh, I hope that I've convinced you today that EEG is not only a brain imaging tool for the poor, but it's actually the ultimate brain imaging tool for those who are interested in temporal dynamics of large scale brain networks in real life situations. And on top of that, I would add possibly one of our um, unique tools for understanding plasticity as well. Um, so just a huge thanks to these people here, particularly those in the red boxes um, as they contributed massively to the work that I've presented today. Um, and yeah, I've left lots of time for questions. So shoot. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to whether you're aware of any evidence or whether something that you're working on that about kind of more direct evidence linking to the potential dimension of the uh, visual uh, visual book potentials to something like the, the brain driving topic factor or some like kind of standard markers of, of uh, yeah, neurogenesis or, or synaptic plasticity. Um, yeah, so, so is there kind of any validation on that? Yeah, that's a good question. So in terms of specifically with BDNF, um, we've, uh, we do have some data um, where we looked at the BDNF val net polymorphism and we found that LTP was greater in, visual LTP was greater in those who carried the um, val val, who were val vals, so people who have higher synthesis of um, BDNF um, and that, that was also related to memory performance. Um, the visual LTP paradigm and the mismatch negativity have also been studied in rodents where um, uh, we've, uh, so in the example of the visual mismatch negativity paradigm, um, sorry, visual mismatch negativity, visual LTP paradigm, um, uh, where things like um, NMDA agonists and antagonists have been used, so we know it's related to like glutamatergic functioning. Um, so there is, there is some trans translational evidence there as well, yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? So there is, um, we have looked at like visual LTP and, and memory performance, um, but not any specific cognitive tasks. So that's a really, that I can think of. That is something that we will be exploring though. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, <coughs> So um, the, in the psilocybin data, these were people who had not taken a psychedelic before. Bad experiences. So when they so when they come in for our, our studies, whether they have bad experiences, um, we have people who have more challenging experiences. Um, but it's you know in this in the psilocybin work, they're always in a therapeutic environment. Um, so we um, sort of hold that experience with them. Yeah. 